Harvest New Beginnings Church is located in Oswego, Illinois. We exist for God's glory alone, encouraging each other to have a deep love for God and a sincere love for people. This message is brought to you by Pastor Scott Poling. Most of you probably knew, but I grew up East Coast, Ocean City, New Jersey, so uh, I, I know what it's like to live on the ocean. I know what it's like to be out in rough seas. Uh, to be out there and not be able to see anything for miles on a boat, and then the ocean gets rough, and it's scary, let me tell you. That's what happened a couple weeks ago down in the panhandle of Florida. They were 10 miles out, three friends, into the Gulf of Mexico, and they were fishing, and an unexpected storm hit. The first wave shorted out and killed their motors. The second wave filled their boat halfway with seawater. A third wave hit, pumping more water on the deck. And then the fourth wave completely capsized these guys' boats. Uh, the, the boat was capsized, turned it upside down, threw them into 60-foot deep water. So here they are, it's getting dark, in 60-foot deep water, floating out, cannot see land anywhere. They managed to get off a May Day before the last wave hit with their coordinates. Florida Fish and Wildlife didn't have a large enough vessel to rescue them. Coast Guard was too far away. It was a three-hour trip to get to them. The men soon came to the realization that no one was going to come, and darkness was descending. Very fortunate for them, there was another boat of four fishermen and they were making their way into port after a very long day of fishing, and they heard the distress signal and decided to head back out into the storm. One of the men is quoted as saying, we've got to go get those guys, and that's what they did. I want you to understand that God looks down upon this world, and this world is drowning in sin. It's filled with capsized lives everywhere, waves of chaos and confusion and people flailing, souls floating aimlessly and lost all over this planet. And people are everywhere scared. They're hopeless. And the darkness of death is descending upon everyone. And God heard. And God hears. He hears those mayday calls. He hears those signals that ascend to heaven. He hears those cries for help. And aren't you glad he heard your cry when you cried out to God? You know, he, he can ignore cries. He could have ignored our cry. He could have let us succumb to the fate of our, our, what we deserve as sinners. But he didn't. And in a sense, he said, we've got to go get those guys. And the greatest rescue mission was started. He sent his son he sent his son into the, state, the, the raging storm of this world. And, and he sent his son in the vessel of a human body. God himself became a man. And on this greatest rescue mission, he started to rescue mankind. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16, probably one of the most familiar, most popular, most memorized, most recognized verses in all of the Bible. And I invite you to turn to John 3.16. This is the verse that is so familiar, so recognized that it's seen at college basketball championships. It's seen at World Series games. It's seen on the eye black of famous football players like Tim Tebow. By the way, 94 million people Googled John 3.16 that day when he wore that. It's seen on TV programs, sometimes ones you wouldn't expect. <laughs> it's on the bottom of cups at In-N-Out Burger. It's on shopping bags at Forever 21. It's even on advertisements for oil changes. Quote John 3.16 and receive a 19.99 oil change. <laughs> But most importantly, John 3.16 is seen on the pages of Scripture, but it is rarely seen in context. And we're preaching through, going through the book of John, and today we come to this famous verse, John 3.16. Jesus is having a private conversation with a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus is kind of snuck in under cover of darkness because he wants to talk to Jesus. He recognizes him as a teacher of God. 
And Nicodemus, we are told earlier in John chapter 3, that, that he's a Pharisee. He's a very extremely religious man, and he's trained expert in the Mosaic law. And we're told that he's a ruler of the Jews. He's part of this elite ruling class, probably the Sanhedrin, of 70 individuals over the decisions, spiritual decisions for the direction of the entire nation. Jesus calls him the teacher. So he's very well educated and he's very well known in the nation of Israel as a teacher of the word of God. We saw last week that Jesus talks to Nicodemus. What did he tell him? You must be born again. And you should understand what it means to be born again. And you need to believe in order to have eternal life. And Jesus will use the Old Testament illustration of Moses in the wilderness. In John 3, 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And so God is on this rescue mission, and every human is going to die. We are snake bitten by deadly, fatal sin. Every human who has ever walked on this planet is snake bitten by sin, and it's fatal. And every human needs what only Jesus can give, the serum of salvation through the blood of our Savior. And so God is on a rescue mission to rescue humanity. We need to look to Him. We need to believe on Him. And we need to be saved by Him. The greatest rescue mission, number one, starts with God. Say that with me. It starts with God. It doesn't start with me and it doesn't start with you. Humanity could never save itself. We need divine intervention. And it is God who looks down upon us and takes pity. And it is God who initiates your rescue and my rescue. And it is God who pursues us in our sin. Listen to the words of Scripture in Ephesians chapter 1. Just as he, that is God, chose us in him before the foundation of the world. In love, he predestined us to adoption of sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. And you may say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Scott, I don't understand this. I, I thought I called out to God for salvation. You did. I, I thought I asked the Lord to forgive me and save me. You did. Romans 10, 13, for whoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. But both are true. Both are true. And beyond our full comprehension, that we are chosen in God, and yet we choose God. All we can do is live with an incredible gratitude at God's divine rescue that He saved our souls. Think of it in terms of a wild, rabid, vicious, nasty, dirty, flea bitten, full of disease dog. Rabid dog, vicious dog. And you go up to it and say, here, Poochie Poo. <laughs> I don't think so. It bares its teeth and it growls and it digs in to protect its territory or it runs in fear. And, and honestly, you look at the scroungy mutt like that and you think somebody should put it down. I want you to understand before salvation, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, there is nothing to endear us to God. There, there is nothing cute and cuddly about us. Now, I had cute and cuddly visit me last Thursday. Here's cute and cuddly, okay? This is Cindy Dean's grand dog, Cedar. It's a sheep -a doodle half sheep dog, half standard poodle, pretty much all panda. But anyway, <laughs> you're talking cute and you're talking cuddly and sweet and soft and gentle and tail wagging and calm and friendly, just... That's not you. And that's not me. That's not us. I want you to understand that before salvation. Before salvation, we run from God. We want nothing to do with God. We growl at God. We spurn the word of God. We mock God. We curse God. We refuse to believe in God. That is the world in which we live. The world is not friendly toward God. Why? Because we're rabid with sin. That's why. 
And you know what's amazing is that God could have chose to put us down. But he doesn't. He pursues us. Wild dogs don't pursue humans. And wild humans don't pursue God. And humans have been running from God all the way back ever since the Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 3, the man and his wife, Adam and Eve, they come looking for God. No, they don't. What do they do? They hid themselves. They hide themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden, like that's going to help them hide from God. And the Lord God calls to the man and says to him what? Where are you? Where are you? Adam and Eve have rebelled against God, and Adam and Eve are hiding from God. And how foolish to think that we can hide from God. And there may be some of us here today that are hiding from God. You're hiding sin. You've been living in a way that you know is wrong. You're running from God. Even being in church, you are not walking with your Savior. It's just a show. I want you to understand God is pursuing you because He loves you. He's calling to you. He knows right where you are in your spiritual life with Him. And He still cares for you. And He pursued Adam and Eve and He pursues us as well. Why does He pursue us? Secondly, because the greatest rescue mission is motivated by love. It's motivated by love. For God, for God so loved, He pursues us because He loves us. 1 John 4.10, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation. That's the satisfaction. That's the payment for our sins. 1 John 4.19, we love because he what? He first loved us. So God pursued us First, because he loves us. And the word for love is agape. And the greatest explanation of, of agape is in 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. And the first two descriptions are given. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love is what? Patient and kind. God's patient, kind love is what radically transformed my life and your life as a Christian. His patient, kind love. And it wasn't God's laws that led us to repentance. It was God's love. It, it, God doesn't smash us into submission. He woos us with his patient, kind love. Romans 2.4. Do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience? Not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. Titus 3. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. See, it's His patient, kind love that softens and melts ice-cold hearts. Uh, Carla's on a missions trip right now, and my sweet wife made all these meals for me and froze them ahead of time. I am spoiled rotten, I know. And, and yeah, I heard that. Somebody said, yeah, but anyway. Um, so so, so I'm, I'm cooking for the family right now. <laughs> so I set out these frozen food and it's in a Ziploc baggie. And, and, and how do I defrost it? I take a hammer to it. No, I don't. I set it out. I put it in some hot water. It was in the Ziploc baggie. I let it defrost. I give it time. I want you to understand, that's the patience and the kindness and the love of God. He could smash us into submission. And he doesn't. He's patient. And he's kind. And he's loving. And by the way. That's some great parenting advice right there too. We could smash our kids into submission. Sometimes it's much better to be patient. And kind. And loving. That, that doesn't negate, negate the, the importance of rules and required obedience and discipline if they don't follow through. 
But for some of us as parents, we need to be more like God is with us. We need to be patient. We need to be kind. We need to show that love. And by the way, that's what we need as husbands and wives. Not smash each other. To be more patient. To be more kind. And to show that kind of love with our husbands, with our wives. I want you to notice, he pursues us with this kind of love. This patient, kind love. And I want you to understand, back to the definition in 1 Corinthians 13, we see that it's a never-ending love. It doesn't stop. That, that this love never ends. It's this eternal love. It's this flame and this warmth of love that never dies. And so our eternal God exhibits this eternal love. And not only that, it's this limitless, immeasurable love. In Ephesians chapter 3, the same word, verse 18, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breath and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. So this is eternal love in every direction. Every direction, it goes on and on and on and on forever, and there is no end to the love of God. You can't see its end because it has no end. That's God's love for you. It has no end. And it never will end. It's an eternal, immeasurable love. And, and it's, it's an inseparable love. Romans chapter 8, who, who's going to separate us from the love of Christ? Is tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? The, the enemy will lie, and lie to you. When you're going through the difficulties of life and you think, God doesn't love me anymore. No, God's love has not stopped for you. He lets you go through trials to grow your faith, to help you learn. His love has never ended with you. It will never stop for you. You are inseparable from the love of God. Verse 37, in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, principalities, nor things present, nor things that come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's inseparable. It's immeasurable. It's eternal. Oh, and by the way, this love that God has for you is to be the same love you are to have for others. To share this love with brothers and sisters in Christ. Whether you like them or not. Whether you agree with them or not. We are not to keep this love to ourselves. John 13, 34. Jesus said, a new commandment I give you that you what? Love one another. Even as I have loved you. He loves us with a limitless, immeasurable, eternal, forever in every direction love. That is how you are to love other Christians. Limitless love, eternal love, immeasurable love, every direction love. That is how you are to love other believers in Jesus Christ. Even as I've loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. John 15, 12. This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is what? It's perfected in us. So start perfecting your love with other Christians. You say, well, I don't like those people. You think God really liked you? You think really God thought you were something special when he picked you up? All the sin in your life, how you were living, what you were doing, and yet God still chose to love you. He says that's how you are to love other believers in Jesus Christ. They aren't perfect, they never will be perfect. And so you love them with the love that Jesus showed to you. You love them with the love God has showed to you. Oh, and by the way, not just other Christians but the people of this world too. Matthew chapter 5, 43. Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I say to you, what? Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. 
Who's your enemy at work? Love them. The ex-spouse, love them. That neighbor, love them. That coworker, love them. As God has loved you, love others. The greatest rescue mission starts with God, and it's motivated by love, and it's unprecedented in scope. We're talking massive, worldwide scale. For God so loved the what? The world. This is huge. And world means world. God loves this world. All the people presently on this planet, God loves. All people throughout all ages of time, God loves. Starting with the very first two humans in the garden, ending with the very last humans, whoever they will be, to be born on this earth. God loves this world and desires to rescue this world. That is why Jesus died for the sins of the elect. No. That's why Jesus died for the sins of those predestined. No. That is why we read in 1 John 2, 2, that he himself is the propitiation, the payment, the satisfaction for our sins, and not for ours only, but also those of what? The whole world. I take world very literally because God takes world very literally. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. It is unlimited in scope, not just the sins of his children did he die for. He died for the sins of the world. It is unlimited in scope, but it is limited in application. It doesn't mean everybody goes to heaven just because Jesus died for their sins. It doesn't teach universalism. That everybody will be saved and everybody... No, that is not the case. See, a man can purchase a very expensive 10-carat diamond engagement ring, let's say worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, or or depending on the quality, it could be worth a million dollars. And he can take it to the woman that he loves and get down on one knee and ask her to marry him, and she can say no. And she can reject his love. And she can reject his gift. I want you to understand, people do that with God all the time. They reject his love all the time. And they reject the gift of salvation, sadly, all the time. World means world. Jesus died for the sins of the world. And and I think this had to blow Nicodemus away. Back to the context, he's talking to this religious leader. And this religious leader knows that God loves Israel. He knows that God loves the chosen people. He knows that God loves religious people. But Nicodemus has no clue how much God really loves this world. And Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, you got to get out of your religious box. He doesn't just love the people that are like you. He loves every people group. He loves every nationality. He loves every skin color. He loves every language. Red and yellow, black and white, they are what? Precious in his sight. By the way, that's who's in heaven. Revelation 5, 9. You were slain and purchased for God with your blood. Men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Notice here. God is not a white Republican American. Can you believe that? Revelation 7, 9. Behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation, all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. I want you to get this. There is no place for racism in the life of a believer. There is no place for racism within the walls of a church. There is no place for racism before the throne of God. None. Christian, get out of your racist religious box. God doesn't just love people just like you. He loves this world. God loves every people group, every nationality, every skin color. Don't fall victim to the Nicodemus disease. 
My wife right now is in the Middle East on a missions trip. And I can't give you the name of the country for safety and security reasons. But she's working with Iraqi and Syrian refugees. And it's an evangelistic camp. And they're teaching them English. And they're using the Bible and they're reading verses out of Scripture. And they know that going in. She's working with people of different nationalities, languages, and colors. That's what God loves. He loves this world. Oh, and by the way, God loves every sexual orientation. Wait a minute, Pastor Scott, you're not going liberal on us. No. I didn't say he loves the sin. But he loves that whole L, B, or L, G, B. I can never get those letters right. The whole LGBTQ community. He loves lesbians and gays and bisexuals and transgenders and queers. He doesn't approve of their sin. Neither should we. But he loves them. He died for the sins of what? The world, and they are inside this world. We've had Christopher Yuan speak here. How many of you have heard Christopher Yuan? Christopher Yuan is a saved former homosexual who's now a professor at Bible, uh, Moody Bible Institute. And, and we've had him speak at our church before. I just want you to understand, get outside of your religious box. He loves the world. Billions and billions of people. He, he, he just loves them all, these masses of humanity. That also means he loves your next door neighbor who doesn't know Jesus. And he loves your coworker in the office or cubicle next to you. And he loves that teammate that's on your team. Loving the world means he loves every single individual. See, this greatest rescue mission, it starts with God and it's motivated by love and it's unprecedented in scope and it comes at the greatest price. This is one expensive rescue mission. Now, the Apollo 13 launched April 11th, 1970. It was a three-person crew. James Lovell, John Swigert, and Fred Hayes. Their mission, the Apollo 13 mission, was to land on the moon. And 56 hours into the launch, an oxygen tank exploded. They had to get back to Earth or die. Only two choices. Uh, the rescue was a group effort. It took three and a half days for them to land safely and splash down in the South Pacific Ocean. Uh, the, the, the entire rescue or, or mission in today's dollars would be $53 billion, B, with a b b b billion, okay? What does that work out? Three, three astronauts divided into $53 billion. It averages out to $17.7 billion per astronaut it cost to save their lives. $17.7 billion per man. Can I tell you something? Nothing compares to the cost that it costs to save you. That doesn't even come close. God Almighty, the second person of the Trinity, the Creator Himself, comes out of heaven to die on the cross for you. You are worth many more than billions and trillions in the eyes of God. You are priceless in the eyes of God. And it says here, he gave, freely gave his son, willingly gave. He didn't have to give. And his only begotten, meaning unique or one of a kind. Literally, only begotten means uh, referring to only generated. It, it, it means the incarnation, God Becoming a man, the second person of the Trinity, clothed in humanity, taking on flesh, dying for our sin, dying in our place. Romans 8, 3. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. He sacrificed his only son. I, I don't know what it would be like to sacrifice one of my boys. I've got three boys. I just can't imagine. I, I just don't know what that would be like. I do know what it's like to watch your youngest son 
He was 14 at the time, being wheeled down the hall of the hospital, Lutheran General in Park Ridge. He had a CVM, a cavernous um, malformation, venous malformation in his brain. And it was either bleed out and die or have it removed. And so Carl and I prayed over that boy, gave him to God, but we didn't know if we'd ever get him back. There's, there's nothing like the feeling of saying, God, here's my son. And I don't know if I'm going to see him again. But he's in your hands. And if he does come back, I don't know if he's going to be normal. I don't know if he'll be able to speak. I don't know if he'll be able to walk. I don't know where he'll be. I just don't know. So I know what it's like to say goodbye to my son and trust him into God's hand. But, but we gave our son to save him from death. And God gives his son to save me from death. And God gave his son to save you from death. That's how much you are loved. That's how much. 2 Corinthians 9.15, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Greatest rescue mission. It requires a response. It requires a response. It says here, whoever believes in him, a response is needed. The choice is yours, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. Whoever. In other words, anyone and everyone can be saved from their sins. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God could save anyone and everyone from their sins? Do you think God could save the worst sinner imaginable from their sins? Do you really think that? Do you really think that God in his grace and mercy would save anybody no matter how bad their sin is? Tell me. Have you ever heard of the man Jeffrey Dahmer? Jeffrey Dahmer, for you who are younger, was a horrible sexual pervert. He was a serial killer, killing 17 men and boys. Also practicing cannibalism. Many don't realize that Pastor Kurt Booth of Oklahoma reached out to Jeffrey Dahmer when he was in prison, mailed him a Bible correspondence course, teaching him the steps of salvation. Dahmer would correspond back and forth with this pastor in Oklahoma, sending the answers and finishing the course. He desired to be baptized. Booth finally found a pastor. He had a hard time finding a pastor that would go to the prison. That's sad. His name was Roy Ratcliffe in Wisconsin. And he would baptize Jeffrey Dahmer in a whirlpool in the prison. And then after that time, every single Wednesday, he would have Bible study and prayer with Jeffrey Dahmer. Every Wednesday, Bible study and prayer. Bible study and prayer. Dahmer would eventually be killed in prison. But I want you to think about this. You may very well see Jeffrey Dahmer in heaven. Because God can save who? Anyone and everyone. So you may be here today and you may think God could could never save me. Pastor Scott, you don't know what I did in my past. You don't know how bad I've been. You don't understand the abuse. You don't understand. Just name it. Doesn't matter. You need to understand God will save you. And he will forgive you. If you but call on the name of the Lord, he says, whoever, whoever, and whoever believes, you've got to believe. You need to place your trust in him and place your faith in him. In in faith, they look to the serpent on the pole and live physically. And in faith, we look to Jesus who died on the cross and we live eternally. And it says, believe in him. So the object of our faith is Jesus and Jesus alone because Jesus and Jesus alone can save us. The object of our faith is not, well, you know, I was baptized. Wrong answer. Well, you know, I've been a good person or I've gone to church or I'm a member or or my religious upbringing. I, I grew up in a religious Christian home. That means nothing. The object of your faith and my faith must be Jesus and Jesus alone. And that's the message we need to get out to this world. Because so many people say, yeah, I'm going to heaven because I'm a 
good person. And we need to tell him, wrong object of faith. God is the only one that is good, and God is the only one that can save, and God is the only one that can forgive. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. There is no other way to be saved. There is no other way to be rescued. Here's some familiar verses. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. How many? No one. It's Jesus alone. Acts 4, 12, there is salvation in no one else. For there's no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Acts 2.21, it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be what? Saved. Romans 10.9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be what? Saved. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be what? Saved. So when do we call out? Now. 2 Corinthians 6.2, behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We need to let people know they can be saved now. You may be here this morning, and you thought you were going to heaven. You need to understand you can know for sure that you can be saved now. Before you leave this place, you need to call on the name of the Lord, and He will save you. This greatest rescue mission requires a response And what else does he teach us? Because it saves from certain death and judgment. That's what this rescue mission does. It saves me from certain death and judgment. And it saves you from certain death and judgment. It says here that whoever believes in him shall not perish. Shall not perish. What does that mean? That means a full pardon for my sin. No judgment for my sin. No damnation for my sin. No condemnation for my sin. Romans 8, 1, therefore there is now no condemnation for those. That's good news in Christ Jesus. You are not going to be condemned for your sin, not now nor ever. You're not going to be judged for your sin, not now nor ever. Because Jesus took your sin on himself on the cross. See, Jesus is our only hope of escape. That's why Hebrews 2, 3 says, how will we escape? If we neglect so great a salvation. And the answer is, you can't. Because you can't save yourself. And no one else can save us except Jesus. So if you neglect this salvation, you cannot be saved. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. What does it mean to perish though? Shall not perish. It's the judgment of a holy God. It's the final eternal judgment. It's utter ruin in hell, apart from God. It's, it's not uh, annihilation. That's not what it is. I like what commentator John Phillips says. He puts it this way. But God threatens to allow sin to complete its work beyond the grave by destroying the soul. The soul does not perish like the body. body. The soul is immortal. Sinners take with them into eternity unquenchable thirsts, terrible passions and appetites, mad cravings, inflamed desires, fierce longings, furious hates, lusts, loathings, white-hot temper, spine-chilling fear. These destructive character traits will continue to ravage the soul and will never be either satisfied or stilled. Jesus can take all that away. Let Jesus take it all away. And this isn't even mentioning the pain of unquenchable flame and worms that destroy. He's talking eternity apart from God. There's no peace. There's no joy. There's just torment. Would you just humble yourself and ask Jesus to save you? I want you to understand, the rescue boat has pulled up. It's there. Your life is capsized in sin. Just get in the rescue boat. This isn't like the Titanic. You realize when the Titanic went down, 1,517 people died. They perished. 
There were only 20 lifeboats. They needed 48. They only had 20. And by the way, those 20 lifeboats that they had could hold 1,178 people. Only 712 got in the lifeboats. Only 712. By the way, two out of the 20 lifeboats that launched simply floated away with no one in them. 466 of those who died, died due to unused lifeboat space. 466 died because they weren't in lifeboats. How many people will perish? There's plenty of room in heaven. (laughs) Jesus says, I've died for the sins of the world. We've got to tell people, get in the boat. Get in the boat. And lastly, we see that the greatest rescue mission secures eternal life. You shall not perish, but have eternal life. What a trade-off. You can perish or you can have life. Duh. I'm going to take life. How about you? I don't want to face judgment. I don't want to face damnation. I am a sinner. And there is a gracious God who's going to forgive me and save me. I choose life. Truly, truly, John 5, 24, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life, does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. And he says here, you shall have it. This is security. You can know for certain you are saved and life eternal is yours forever. There are sometimes I run into Christians who struggle with whether they're really saved or not. And I don't know if I'm really saved and I sinned and did I lose my salvation. I want to give you a fourfold promise from God's word that assures you you are saved. If you are truly saved, you are saved forever. John chapter 10, verse 27 through 29. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. He says, I know who are mine. And they follow me. Verse 28. Here's the first promise. I give them, I give eternal life to them. How, old, how long is eternal? It's forever. That's Jesus' promise. I give you eternal life. So that's the first promise. And they shall never perish. That's the second promise. You're never going to face damnation and judgment. You will not perish. Here's the third promise, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. That's the security in the hands of your Savior who died on the cross for you. And he says, you're not going anywhere. I hold you in my hands. You're secure. And if that's not enough, he gives the fourth promise. My Father who's given them to me, he's greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. You have eternal life. You're not going to perish. You are safely in the hands of Jesus. And you are safely in the hands of the Father. And we need to know this and hold on to it. 1 John 5.13 These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Not, I think I have eternal life. You need to know it. If you have received Jesus as your Savior, place your faith in Him and Him alone, you are saved because of Jesus. Know it. And you can't be lost. Well, what if I sin? What if I do something wrong? What if I fall away from God? Listen carefully. There was no good work that you did that saved you. There could be no bad work that you do that loses you. Your salvation is not dependent on you. Your salvation is dependent on your God. And he's the one that saves you. And he's the one that secures you. And then you say, well, what about my sin? Or what about another Christian who's living in sin? And they say they're saved. And then they've turned away from God. Two things here. A Christian who says they're saved and then lives like the devil is either one, not truly saved. We learn about four types of soil in the Gospels. Not everybody who says they're saved is saved, so they could be unsaved and just giving lip service to it. But they could be saved, and if they are saved, God spanks his own kids. Nobody gets away with their sin. Understand that. 
And so Christians who are away from God, they will fall under the disciplining, loving hand of their father. And he tells us in Scripture that he disciplines his own, sometimes so severely that he calls them home. Understand that. So nobody gets away with their sin. He says, but they will have, have. And he tells us, what do you have? Eternal life. Man, this life is short, isn't it? We're going to have eternal life. Don't get your eyes on this life. You've got eternal life coming. you got forever life coming. We saw that Jesus defined that last week. John 17, 3. This is eternal life. What is it? What is eternal life? He tells us that they may know you. The only true God in Jesus Christ with whom you've sent. Eternal life is knowing God, your creator God, and enjoying him forever. What is eternal life? Ephesians 2, 6, and 7. It's being raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ and for the ages to come that he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus to experience the grace of God forever and ever and the kindness of God forever and ever. That's heaven. Oh, and by the way, 1 Corinthians 15, I've stood at the graveside of many, many Christians and used this this passage as I have stood there. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body, it's raised what? Imperishable. It's sown in dishonor. There's no honor in taking a dead body that's decaying and sticking it Six feet in the dirt. Okay? It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in what? Glory. It's sown in weakness. There's no power. There's no strength. It's raised in power. Just as we've borne the image of the earthly, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. And so what is heaven? Heaven is a resurrected, glorified body. It's an imperishable body, a glorious body, a powerful body, a heavenly body. Forget a beach body, you're going to have a heavenly body. Think about that. That's heaven. How is it possible? Philippians 3.21. Because he's going to transform the body of this humble state into conformity with the body of his glory to the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. He's creator God. He can do anything. And that's heaven. That's eternal life. The greatest rescue mission. What did we learn? Same with me. That it starts with God. It's motivated by love. Unprecedented in scope. Came at the greatest price. Requires response. Saves from certain death and judgment. And secures eternal life. And all God's people said, Amen. If you've been prompted by this message and are in need of a new beginning or would like more information about Harvest New Beginnings, visit at harvest.church.